Turn to Matthew chapter 2. Let's read this together. Matthew chapter 2. I mean, let me read it out loud and you read it quietly. (laughs) Matthew chapter 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, and that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled with the prophet what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. Then he went and lived in a city called Nazareth so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Let's stop and pray again. Lord, one of the things that pops out in this chapter is the fulfillment of prophecy over and over again. Your word speaks of what you will do, and then you do it. Lord, help us to understand that that you are trustworthy, that you are faithful, that you are a covenant-keeping God who speaks and acts and does so for your own glory and for our good. So we pray that you would help us to understand these things today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Of all of the stories of Christmas, none has more legend attached to it than of this than this one, the account of these three wise men, as we often hear. And I say legend because there's so much that we sing about, uh, so many of the stories that we hear, and sometimes the things that we believe that are simply not in Scripture. We don't know how many magi visited, or if they were technically kings. Many of us, including our family, have nativity scenes set up at home um, that depict the wise men, the magi, at the manger. 
but they probably didn't show up until maybe a year or so later. And so while it might not be too harmful to assume some of those things, it doesn't undermine our faith after all. We need to remember what's really happening here. It's trendy among Christians um, to say that Jesus is the reason for the season. We like rhymes. But it's true. He is, right? And in this passage, really the first 12 verses are what we're going to be looking at today. Um, there are five truths about Jesus that we cannot miss. This week, you will eat too much. <laughs> you will drive too many miles. You'll be stressed out. The kids will be more interested in the box than the toy. You will say to your husband or to your wife, next year we're going to do this different. But you probably won't. But you're also going to laugh this week. You're going to take a lot of pictures. You're going to enjoy time with family and friends. You'll be filled with genuine joy and happiness. You will be thankful. And in the midst of all of that, don't forget these five truths about Jesus. I'm going to give you all five and then we're going to go back through them one at a time. The first one is this, Jesus is Messiah, King of the Jews. Jesus will be worshipped by all the nations. God's plan is for Christ to be worshipped. Number four, Jesus brings trouble. And number five, worshipping Jesus means submission. Now, before we go through each of those five truths, let me just give you just a, just a little bit of background of what's going on in this passage. So look at verse 1. Matthew 2, 1 says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Now there are several Herods in the New Testament, but this one was specifically Herod the Great. And he was only king in the sense that he was appointed to his position by Julius Caesar, the leader of the Roman Empire. And he was given this title king as an, an honorary title. Actually, his full title was, get this, king of the Jews. But he served, Herod the Great, served at the pleasure and discretion of the Roman Caesar. Herod the Great was known for his massive building projects, um, including the rebuilding of the Jewish temple, Zerubbabel's temple that had been destroyed in the period between the Old and New Testaments. But not being Jewish himself, Herod oversaw this building project. He, he did this, had the temple rebuilt in order to try to win the favor of his Jewish subjects. But Herod was also paranoid. And because of family troubles, he believed that many people were trying to overthrow him. And in fact, two of his own sons did plot against him, and so he had them executed. Near the end of his life, around the time of Christ's birth, in fact, we know he died, history tells us he died in, in 4 BC, which means probably our dates are off just a little bit. But by the end of his life, his paranoia and his suspicion left him virtually insane. In fact, he was insane enough to commit the genocide that we read about in this chapter. Well, verse 1 also mentions the wise men, or the magi is probably a better title for them. Tradition calls them kings, but it's just simply tradition. It's highly unlikely that they were kings in a, in a royal sense. These were most likely pagan astrologers from the east, meaning that they were, they were probably Persian, probably from around the city of Babylon. If you know anything about history, the history of Israel, especially when you get deep into the Old Testament, as Ben's been going through in Sunday school, but there is a large, even at this time, 
the birth of Christ, there was a large Jewish population in and around Babylon because of the exile from earlier. And so these men evidently had access to the Jewish scriptures, and they, they knew to look for a Messiah. And I think it should be noted that it is, it's actually ironic, and it's, and it's just like God, by the way, to choose to reveal himself to these men. Somehow. Somehow. And all the information that we have about how they knew to look for a Messiah at all is just what's written in these verses. I recently read a pastor online somewhere, I don't even remember who it was, that said, I, I wish we had one more verse about the Magi. But we could say that about a lot of things in Scripture. But we don't. We don't have one more verse. We have what is right here. And so God somehow directed their study of the stars and somehow led them to believe that a great leader had been born in Jerusalem. And let me answer for you the somehow, okay? God did it. God miraculously intervened in their hearts and in their minds and did this. That's the only conclusion that we can come to, especially with the information provided here. We believe that God did this. But we also should remember, God does not normally work through astrology. <laughs> we understand that to be true. God does not normally work through astrology. How he did it, it does not say in Scripture, just that they saw his verse, verse 2 says. I mean, his star, verse 2 says. They saw his star. And then verse 3 says that when they arrived in Jerusalem, probably with a large entourage, just to clarify, they had three gifts. We don't know how many magi were there, or three that are named. But we do know that their visit, and probably all of the rumors associated with these guys showing up there and their, and their entourage, it upset the whole city from King Herod on down. Something is happening. When these guys show up. So let me read verses 1 to 6 again. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men, magi from the east, came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all of the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. This is the first truth that we need to remember this holiday season and really always. Jesus is Messiah, King of the Jews. Now there's an important distinction here as we work through this. Somewhere out there in America is a child who will grow up to one day be our president, right? In fact, we could, we'd have to say that there are probably, there have to be multiple children out there in America who will one day grow up to be president of these United States, but nobody's looking for them now, except for maybe a few moms and dads. Nobody's looking for this child like they look for the Messiah here. That's not the way we operate. But notice what they're saying. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Not born to be king, born king. They're talking about what he is, not what he will be someday when he grows up. They're talking about what he is. Jesus Christ was born king of the Jews. For we saw his star when it rose. There's a lot of guessing about what this means, what it is. Um, scientifically. But we can't get hung up about what this star really is or really was, scientifically speaking. We only know for certain what is written here, and so we have to take this at face value. God is intervening. 
Look at verses 3 and 4. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Did you notice the transition? Magi showing up, asking where he is, who has been born king of the Jews, and Herod automatically assumes that they mean the Christ. They didn't, they didn't say, where is he who has been born who's going to overthrow Herod the Great? Herod, did you, did you have a son? We heard you had a son. He just automatically assumed they mean the Christ. They mean the Messiah. So it's ironic because according to Rome, Herod's the king of the Jews. But nobody viewed him as the Christ. Nobody viewed Herod as their Messiah. So let's put this together. We have to think about this. According to the scriptures, the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, was the long-awaited, God-ordained heir to the throne of David who will overcome all of the other rulers, bring about the end of the broken, corrupt world as we know it, who will establish the kingdom of God and never die or lose his reign. Herald, Herod, not Harold, Herod was troubled. Herod was troubled when he heard this. We don't know why, but he believed the Magi. He got the message. He understood that the Magi were not searching for a mere ordinary human successor to him. They were searching for the king of kings. He understood this somehow. This was the last thing that Herod wanted. But he didn't even know where to look for the Messiah. Remember, he's not Jewish. Herod is not Jewish. He didn't grow up studying the law and the prophets. And so he turns to the chief priests and the scribes. He brings in the Jewish experts. But did you pick up uh, on his line of questioning for them? He, he doesn't ask if the claim is true. He doesn't say, could this be possible? He asked them, where was this supposed to take place? And I think that's interesting because, remember, he's, he's paranoid. He's afraid that everybody's out to get him. And so he assumes that the chief priests and the scribes, they must have this information. In fact, they're probably in on this. And to be honest, they should have been. The chief priests and the scribes should have been in on what the real... Uh, birth meant what it really meant they should have said we need to go worship him ourselves when they answered they quoted part of micah 5 2 as we saw in sunday school it's right here in verses 5 and 6 they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. But if they had been doing their job, if the priests and the scribes had been doing their job, they would have continued in that passage from Micah chapter 5, which goes on to say this, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. And then verse 4 says, And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he, has, he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Herod didn't stand a chance against this newborn babe. Because the king of the Jews has been born, and he shall stand and he shall shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, and in the majesty and the name of the Lord his God. And the people will dwell secure, for now he shall be great in the ends of the earth, and I, and I love how it ends, and he shall be their peace. This rule and reign of Christ those words, that's a theme throughout Matthew's gospel. The kingdom, the kingdom of Christ, 
the kingdom of God. And at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus proclaimed, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he explained life in the kingdom when he was at the Sermon on the Mount, especially beginning there with the Beatitudes. It was the question Pilate asked him at his trial at the end of his life. Are you the king of the Jews? This has been a controversy your whole life from the moment you were born. Are you king of the Jews? It was used as a mockery over his head on the cross. This is Jesus, king of the Jews. Didn't the Jews hate that? This idea that Jesus is the king of the Jews is woven throughout Matthew's gospel. And it's all leading up to his so-called crowning at the hands of the blasphemous, sinful men when they made that crown of thorns. And they twisted it onto his head before they lifted him up onto the cross and killed him. You understand that the crucifixion was a kind of demented, perverted coronation. But what man meant for evil, God meant for good. And so let me ask you this question. If Jesus is king of the Jews, where does that leave us? We'll go back to that prophecy in Micah chapter 5, verses 2 to 5. I, I've referred to it in bits and pieces, and, and Ben went through this in Sunday school. But let me just read the whole thing together all again. Listen to these words. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. If Jesus is king, then he is to be worshipped. This king will reign over all. Those verses proclaim, he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And this brings us really here to point number two. The second truth that we have to remember. Not only is Jesus king of of the Jews, but Jesus will be worshipped by all nations. Jesus will be worshipped by all nations. Verse 2, the, the Magi state their intentions. They come to Herod and they say, We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Have come to worship him. Now, this phrase, it can mean pay homage to like you would for any normal king. But Matthew, throughout his gospel, consistently uses it to mean worship like we think of when we think of worship, the traditional sense. But we need to be careful not to read into what's not here. We simply don't know if they worshipped him as the one true God. We believe that they probably did. Or just another in their many pantheon of gods from Babylon. But having said that, having given that caution, look down at verses 11 and 12. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. They fell down at the feet of the child. They fell down at the feet of a child. There was a genuine humility on their part. Later, they're warned in a dream. Apparently, God intervened again here in an unusual and supernatural way. And so while these men were looking at the, to the stars for guidance, God somehow, in his divine sovereignty for his good pleasure, somehow brought these men to himself and then kept them safe. And I want to emphasize here that it, this is not the usual way that God operates 
This is unusual and it's specific in the, in the same way as when he called Moses at the burning bush was, was unusual and specific. But this is what he does for each of us. He calls us to himself and keeps us safe. In fact, I keep stressing that word somehow, but it's the same way that he brings you or me to himself. He calls us. Romans 10 tells us that this normally happens through the preaching of his word. And in this case here, he, he literally drew these men to himself. Well, as we consider this, notice that Matthew doesn't tell us of the Jewish uh, shepherds tending their flocks by night, like Luke does. Matthew doesn't mention them. Instead, he, he tells us that some Gentiles... Some of the, uh, how they were viewed anyway, as unclean pagan idolaters have shown up to worship. What does Matthew tell us at the very end of his book? Do you remember the last couple paragraphs of Matthew's gospel? It's a pretty famous passage. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Go therefore and make disciples of in the United States, in Canada, South Africa, the Marshall Islands. Go and make disciples of all nations. From the very beginning of Matthew's gospel, God is calling all of the nations to come and worship Jesus. And we have to say yes and amen because we are representatives here of all kinds of different nations and nationalities and eth ethnicities and however you want to divide it. We are one in Christ. Even in choosing a particular nation, Israel, God has always planned that Jesus would be worshipped by all the nations. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3 says this, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred to your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Throughout the Old Testament, we continue to see Gentiles continue to, to put their faith in God and in his promises. Think of Rahab. Think of Ruth. The list could go on. Remember from Ben's Sunday school, study of the book of Jonah, the entire city of Nineveh, the capital of the, the fierce Assyrian empire, repents and puts their faith in God. Isaiah prophesied these things in Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 to 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your uprising. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ will be worshipped by all nations. He will be worshipped by the nations and, and he has called us to go out to the highways and hedges to compel people to come in, to go out into the streets and lanes of the city and, and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame, he says. Because at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ will be worshipped by the nations. This is God's plan. This is the third truth that we need to remember as Christians. The reason for the season. God's plan is for Christ to be worshipped. God's plan is for Jesus Christ to be worshipped. Now, this is where I need to be very clear. I am not a universalist. I don't believe that every person will worship Jesus. But I do believe that every knee will bow. And that every tongue will confess. But some will be doing it as the demons do. Some will be doing it because they have no choice. Some will be doing it apart from him. 
Now, over and over, the Bible presents us with baffling accounts that defy scientific explanation. Think of um, creation. Think of the flood, the parting of the Red Sea, manna from heaven, Jonah's fish, the virgin birth, the resurrection. People read these stories and they try to come up with scientific and, and rational explanations. And so as we consider these things, how do these magi follow this star? What does verse 9 mean? Look at verse 9 again. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. What does that mean? Some would say that this is um, Halley's Comet or something like that. It's one of the explanations. We try to come up with scientific, rational explanations, but here's the answer. Here's the answer. This is what this is. We don't know. And it doesn't matter because that completely misses the point. God continues throughout this story to intervene miraculously. The minutiae of the details that Matthew leaves out sometimes keep us from focusing on what God wants us to see. When we, when we focus on those things that are not there, we often miss the, the holiness of God. We miss the ugliness of our own sin. We miss the, the helplessness of, of man, the atonement of Christ, or, or even right here that Christ was born king, that he was worthy of worship as a child, that this was God's plan from the beginning and the nations will worship him. So here's the point. There's a point to everything in the universe, and that is to bring glory to God. This is God's sovereignty over all things. God has ordered all of history for this moment. This is the fullness of time. Luke tells us that God has, has directed the Roman Empire so that Joseph and Mary must go to Bethlehem. He has ordered the family trees of each of these people, Joseph and Mary, such that they, they can trace their genealogy back to King David. He's even ordered the stars, whatever this star was that they saw. Listen to Isaiah 45, verse 12. I made the earth and created man on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens and I commanded all their host. God has ordered all of history, all of creation for this moment, the fullness of time, and it shows us what is to come. He has done this. Listen to Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his sons into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Can you sense the worship? God's plan is for Christ to be worshipped. God's plan is for Christ to be worshipped. However, Number four, Jesus brings trouble. Jesus brings trouble. We can't forget this truth either this Christmas when there is um, stress and strife in our families, maybe. Maybe because you're a Christian. Maybe because you take your Christian faith seriously. When there's stress and strife with your loved ones, when you disagree with some of the choices and decisions some of them are making. Maybe, maybe they even claim to be Christian, but they're not acting Christ-like. They're not bearing fruit in keeping with repentance, and that brings stress and strife to our families. Jesus brings trouble. Look up at verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Jump down to verse 12. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Jesus brings trouble both to his followers and to those who refuse to follow him. 
Herod and all of Jerusalem were troubled by the news that the Christ had been born. But I want you to notice something here. Among those who do not want to worship Christ, there are really kind of two types of people. Those who just simply don't care. They don't, whatever. I, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. You can do whatever you want. There's those who don't care, and there are those who feel threatened by him. Among the uh, people who refuse to worship Christ, there are really two types. Those who don't care, who are apathetic, and those who feel threatened by him. See, the priests and the scribes in this account, they should have seen this moment as the fulfillment of prophecy. They should have run to Bethlehem to worship. They should have rejoiced. They should have praised God in the moment that they heard the news, that his promises were being fulfilled, but they didn't. Apparently, they simply went back to life as usual. Now again, it doesn't tell us, but we know what happens with the scribes and Pharisees later. We know what happens to the priests. They don't worship Christ. They go back to life as normal. But we also know that when Jesus started his ministry, their, their antagonism continued to grow until they finally felt threatened by him and demanded his crucifixion. But it wasn't until they felt threatened by him. At this point, as a baby, it seems like they don't even care. But for those who did feel threatened by the Christ like Herod specifically. Verse 3 says that all of Jerusalem was troubled along with him. And what that really means is that when, when, Herod, when Herod, I keep saying Herod, when Herod is troubled, everybody ran for cover. When Herod is troubled, everybody's troubled because Herod was willing to commit genocide because he felt so threatened. He was willing to lie. He was willing to deceive in order to get rid of this baby in order to get rid of this baby who also is the Christ, Jesus. Verses 7 and 8 again. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. We know that worship was not his intention. He's lying. We see the same response to Christ sometimes today. You're going to see some of the responses as you share your faith uh, this Christmas. Some will say, you know, I love you, but I just don't really care. Can you not talk to me about this so much? Or they're going to be combative and argumentative, right? Right? You'll see indifference and hostility in those who are troubled by Jesus. He himself warned his disciples of this in Matthew chapter 10. Let me just read a couple of these verses. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16 says this. Behold, I am sending you out as a sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. You will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated for, by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next, for truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. This struggle is real. Let me give you just a little bit of trivia as we finish up. Um, Herod was an Edomite. He was a descendant of Esau. Jacob and Esau had struggled with one another. They had wrestled with one another from before birth. The struggle between those who are troubled by Christ and those who worship Christ is real. 
Romans chapter 8, verses 5 to 8 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to the mind set on flesh is death, but to the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Jesus brings trouble to those who do not want to worship him. And for those who do, those who genuinely desire to worship Jesus the Christ, trouble will come. The Magi had to return home another way, verse 12 says, probably for fear of their life. Jesus promised in this world you will have trouble. You will, he says. In this world, you will have trouble. So we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. But then he says, take heart. I have overcome the world. And then the final truth that we need to keep in mind this Christmas is that worshiping Jesus means submission. Worshiping Jesus means submission. It means submission to his authority. He is king of the Jews. Verse 11 tells us that they, they fell down and worshipped him. Falling at the feet of someone is a sure sign of a, of a genuine, humble submission. They fell at the feet of a baby. Compare that to the attitude of Herod, who felt threatened and asserted his authority. And he did so in a deceptive power play. And listen, we, we need to notice this. It was not just their words. It was not just their actions, but it was also their hearts. They quadruple rejoiced. L look at verse 10. They quadruple rejoiced. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They rejoiced, but they didn't just rejoice. They rejoiced with joy. But they didn't just rejoice with joy, they rejoiced with great joy. But they didn't just rejoice with great joy, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. This was genuine. It was true. They were nearer to their Messiah. Worshiping Christ is truly done with joy. This is where the difference between joy and happiness comes in. Genuine worship can be joyful regardless of our circumstances because it's based on Christ and not on us. Many of us are suffering in a variety of ways. Even in this room, we're suffering in a variety of ways, maybe physically, maybe in some other way. Yet we can rejoice because the word has become flesh and dwelt among us. We can rejoice because we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Christ has broken into history in order to make all things new. And so we worship him in joyful submission. We also worship him in sacrifice. That's the end of verse 11 there. Opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And I want you to notice this one thing. This comes after their rejoicing. It comes after falling down in worship. There's been a lot of speculation and even good speculation spilled over the significance of these three gifts. And it can be an interesting and profitable study. But I believe the point here is this. They're expensive. They have brought to him a sacrificial offering. Many of you have made and continue to make sacrificial, sacrificial offerings in order to worship your king. That's been evident to us this year. And I want to remind you that those things do not go unnoticed by our God. Whatever that sacrifice is, if it's a financial sacrifice or a time sacrifice, sacrifice of other things that you could be doing on Sundays, those sacrifices are not unnoticed by the Lord. Today we worship the Messiah. This might bring you trouble, 
Although chances are you'll not have to run for your lives like Mary and Joseph. But you just might need to make changes. The Magi needed to go home a different way. Why? Because from the beginning, people have opposed Christianity, yet God's plan is for Christ to be worshipped. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Rejoice. Rejoice. Emmanuel has come. That's the application today. Rejoice. Emmanuel has come. Pray with me. Lord, I pray that when we leave here today, we would leave with hearts rejoicing that Christ has come, that Emmanuel, God with us, has come. That we have seen Christ in your word, Lord, you have, you have shown him to us. That the word became flesh and dwelt among men. That we have seen the glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That we might have hearts that rejoice because Emmanuel has come. And Lord, as we sing and pray, as we worship today, we have to pray with John, come quickly, Lord. We long for the day when Christ will return. And in the meantime, we rejoice. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.